And now a message from our friends at Fetching Food. The 1970s and 80s had elbow, gravy train, perina, meow mix, and bell bottoms. You've changed your clothes, now change how you feed your pet. Like bell bottoms, kick the kibble and join us in the 21st century with the healthiest diet for dogs and cats. Feed naturally, feed raw, feed Fetching Foods. Pups and kids, and welcome to another fun-filled and informative episode of the Groomer Next Door podcast. I'm your host, Chris Green, and joining us this week is Laura Pekas. She has an amazing blog. She has got acne canine. She has so many amazing things all rolled into one. We are going to drown her right into that in just a moment. But let's get into our fact of the week. In 2003, Dr. Roger Mugford invented the Wagometer, a device that claims to interpret a dog's exact mood by measuring the wag of its tail. I didn't know anything about that until really just about seconds ago, and I'm actually really curious about it. I guess I'm going to have to go and do some research on that. don't think it actually worked because in 2003, 2018, you know, I can kind of guess since I haven't heard anything about it, it may not have done anything. Or I just have lived under a rock. Well, by that sound, Laura is about to enter the podcast studio. So with that said, welcome Laura Pekis to the podcast. K9, we'll talk about training, and so on and so on and so on. Okay, sounds good. This week on the podcast, we have a blogger, we have a dog trainer, we have a dog whisperer, in a sense. Um, probably more than I ever can be. We are joined this week by Laura Pekis, and I'm so happy to be able to talk to you about Spike's dog blog, Acme Canine, and so much more. So thank you for joining us this week. It's a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, you know what's great is Amy Shoji, she, she had put it out there, and it was so remarkable. It was like all, I, I almost in one day was getting multiple different people. I'm talking to multiple people, including yourself, and I was like, I like I like being in, in this kind of spot where you guys were like, hey, I want to talk to you. I'm like, I want to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> it's worked well, out. You. Well, tell us your origin story because that's how we kick off every interview. Every guest comes in. They tell us all of their origin story of how they became who they are. So how did Laura become Laura Pekus? As a dog trainer? Or- you can start <laughs> anywhere you want. It's your story. <laughs> Okay. Well, um, my in my second life, I had to make a career choice, and I had always been in the horticulture business and had dogs on the side, um, and my ex and I had trained dogs to be hunting dogs, and some of the things we did I didn't really approve of, but I didn't know any better, so I trained them that way, and they were successful, so I couldn't really say too much. Um, so as I started coming up with a career choice, I went off to college to be a botanist, and while doing that, um, I gained a giant schnauzer named Woofy, and this dog was nothing like any other dog I had ever trained. Um, wasn't food-oriented at all, very aloof, very independent, um, just a real... and. I don't want to say pain in the butt, but that's exactly what it was. So um, while learning to to train him, I discovered um, a school in Columbus called National Canine. And so I decided, okay, since I'm discovering myself and finding a new career, maybe I will be a dog trainer because I do have a background with animals and I've always been involved with animal behavior. So I went to the school and took Wiffy with me and um, learned another training method that involved the dog working for you and setting rules and making it very black and white when you're communicating with the dog. And it was amazing. Wolfie responded and became an absolutely wonderful demo dog for me. And that was kind of the start of it. So uh, they they 
just nonchalantly tell you that you can become a dog trainer and have your own business, then I must have been somewhere in the world where I said, sure, I can do this. And so I just put up my shingle uh, and in November and, and started uh, Acme Canine. And from that point on, it was kind of an amazing situation because um, I was getting calls from NBC4 to be on TV with them and talk about dog training. And uh, all these avenues opened up, and, and I just uh, got a niche with the veterinarians to work with dogs that had severe behavioral issues and aggression. And that's what I got to be known in the in the area, and so that's how I set up my business, and uh, it's got me to where I am now. And I'm semi-retired, and now writing about all my experiences and uh, and about dog care and dog training. That's interesting. You know, it's it's funny how if you really listen, the one thing that we're supposed to not be able to communicate with really did communicate with you, and that's pets. Mm-hmm. You know, here's something that, that we hear a bark or a meow, and yet a lot of us were able to go, oh, I know what that means, where, you know, a lot of people are just completely turned off to that. They have no idea. That's really cool. It's cool that, that you were able to find it. And, you know, it, we we just recently adopted a, an Akita who we've just started putting in training because it, we wanted to be a shop dog, wanted to come with us to work every time we go to to work every day. And he's, you know, he was left on a dirt lot pretty much all for his first six months and doesn't really have that um, understanding. He's smart, but mm-hmm. you, 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 and you, that's the thing. Dogs are so smart. It's up to us to be able to teach them. And that's the right. hard part. And and I think what happens um, in in many people, you know, they're very passionate about, you know, being a part of working with a dog, but they they're not willing to see that. I mean, each dog is an individual, just like children. I, you know, I I have three kids, and each one had their own way of life, and I had to deal with how to interact with them to get them to do what I needed them to do. And I kind of applied that to dogs because I don't care what the breed is. Within that breed, you're going to have submissive dogs, dominant dogs, and you have to figure out what motivates them so that they they do what you want them to, and, and they want to do what you want them to. And they're not just kind of like, oh, you're yeah, making me do this, you know, that type of thing. And it's it's fascinating. And, and I think people get tied up in, you know, totally positive or totally, um, you know, like just using e-collars or, or whatever it is, when really if you open your mind and say, this dog in this situation needs these things. So one of the things I, I, I'll do is like a canine assessment where I talk to the owners and you're, I, I make it sound, it's almost like uh, doing a, a, uh, a chess game. You make a move, the dog makes a move. You have this background to know that these are some of the things the dog's going to do, but they may fool you and then you have to come up with a different plan. And so when I'm talking to the people, I'm assessing them to see how much time that they're able to put into the training um, and their their lifestyle, you know, with what they want the dog to do, what they're – because my goals shouldn't be their goals because it's their dog and I want them to be happy. So, you know, you're you're kind of – it becomes this mental strain over time because you're you're really thinking about what's best for the person, what's best for the dog, and how do I accomplish my client's goals with the dog's personality and temperament. So I, I love it. It's just – probably the best thing I've ever done because it takes so much um, mental energy to accomplish what you need to do. And unlike raising children that you start seeing results that like when they're in their thirties, um, it's pretty quick. You know, you see a dog change and you see them progressing and it's, it's very, very rewarding too. So um, it's cool. I just think that, that really working with dogs and, and same thing works with cats it's it's kind of like kindergarten or daycare in a sense mm-hmm. because of the age and and the appropriate measures and you know you're going to have your really great kid that is just you know very smart and wants to learn and then you're going to have that kid that's going to want to eat glue and <laughs> yeah. just to say the least and and it's it's really what it comes down to is how do you handle it how do you actually you know train it and would you say that 
it's really more or less teaching the pet parent than it is teaching the dog? Um, well, the, the pet parent, they we tend to do a lot of things unconsciously that encourage a dog to act a certain way that probably in a different environment they wouldn't act that way. So you have to work with the parents to point out, hey, if you're if you're in, you're encouraging your dog to do something you don't want him to do. So like you know we'll say maybe don't pet him all the time, pet him only when they do something you know for you. You know it's just to kind of break some of this this pattern up because. Um, you know, I think people tend to treat dogs a lot like children, and many times that works perfect. I mean, you know, some of the discipline and, and the, the setting boundaries and all those kind of things, I mean, it, behavior is behavior. It's going to work the same if, if it's a child or a chicken or a dog or a lion. Um, but how a dog thinks is differently. They're wired differently than we are, so what we may assume as nurturing to a child, sometimes you can't do that to a dog because it's just encouraging them to be more afraid or less social or, or some things like that. So, yeah, you kind of have to educate the, the parents on dogs don't quite think the same as we do, and, and this is kind of the exceptions that you got to do. My, my favorite is usually by the second or third training session, if the uh, the clients have young children, they'll go, you know, we're starting to use some of these techniques on our kids, and it's working great. <laughs> Because it does. I mean, it's, it's what you're doing is, you know, you're being very clear, clear with your rules. You're giving a consequence if there's if they misbehave and they know what that is. It's not like it's just coming out of the sky. You're praising when they do well. You're encouraging them and motivating them. I mean, it's a, it's a great environment to learn in. And if you do that with a child or if you do it with a dog or even your employees, it's going to be successful because that's, that's the behavior part of training. The art part of training is kind of – this nebulous thing where you're you're reading the animal and trying to understand what they're saying and it's it's a little harder to to figure out but it's a gut feeling that you know you're doing the right thing and you know it's funny because no matter what it's always it still always comes down to the the pet parent because you can only give so much advice and then once they leave well they're it's bad behavior them. yeah exactly yeah yeah well, you know, and and you kind of know. I mean, I, I I do a variety of classes, and I you know I was doing group classes, and I did individual training, and I did residencies. Um, you you have to know the person in order to make it successful. If if I had an extremely busy family, and I told them that they had to come to a group class on a certain day, I'm setting them up for failure, just like I'm setting their dog up for failure. But if I did a residency and got the dog to a certain point where I told him how to manage that dog, that dog is going to be much more successful in that environment than if they would, you know, because they wouldn't make half the classes. And, and so you're you're always working with, the, you know, the person's lifestyle, I guess, is the best thing. And then, you know, making sure that they know what to do to maintain things, you know. So it's, uh, yeah, it is. It's it. It's like anything. I mean, you know, you can go to class and learn things, but unless you apply it, then it's really not worth going to the class. Very true. Now, how many classes, let's just say you're you're signed up to be in your class, how many per week do you do? Um, like a like a group class? It would they, yeah. just Once a week would be the group class okay. for six weeks. So it's pretty, pretty basic. If I went to someone's home, I usually tell them that between the first and second session no more than 10 days because that's more for the person's learning ability because they're going to forget over 10 days and if you do it any sooner I, I don't think that it's it's become enough of a pattern for them but you know usually once they start understanding the training method and know what to do we can go about two weeks in between training um, and that that's kind of how I worked it out so yeah and, and I've, I've done it where people started off doing a class and they decided they wanted to do more individualized training because it was when you're teaching a class you're teaching very general very broad um you know suggestions because you can't say your dog's submissive and your dog's dominant you know your class would never continue so you pretty much just teach the basics of the class um you try to always explain why because every command has a certain reason for doing it and if 
my my opinion is if you understand why you teach the sit and why you teach the down and why you teach the heel, you can apply it then in your own life with when your dog acts a certain way and go, oh, I need to put that dog in a heel because he's focusing more on a squirrel than he is on me. <laughs> you know, so, I mean, you know how to apply it better. So, um, you know, it's just, that's the fun part about it. It's like, as long as you have, you're willing to just kind of finagle into all different kinds of styles, it works really well. You know, it's funny with our first Akita, which, <clears throat> excuse me, which was really kind of the, it was that this dog Katana has always been my, um, I guess, test dog. This is the one that I I really started with. Um, gosh, six seven years ago, something like that. She was my first rescue, um, and you know, I taught her how to. I off leash trained her, even though I have at the time I had zero percent knowledge on how to do any of this stuff, and it was intuitive. I just kind of read her body language and, and the way she was, I was able to off leash train her where uh, it, it was, it was a great, I mean, honestly, it probably, and I'll, I'll be the first one to say, I probably should have failed, but some way, somehow it worked. And then we have a pit bull that again, you know, the, the stereotype dogs, we have them and, and I'm, I'm very much against the labels that go with, with dogs. Yeah. I think it's the people, not the dog. But mm-hmm. with with the pit bull, this pit bull is my mother in law's, and it's the background on that dog is is just so sad. And this dog would take off, literally just take off down the street and run. And sometimes you wouldn't find her for days. And I was able to off leash train that dog, so she's for years now has I mean, I'm thinking five years at least, and and before that you couldn't even dare let her outside without losing her she mm-hmm. became off leash trained and so did the chihuahua um and i've had a little bit more difficulties with the new akita i mean again when you said squirrel he goes mm-hmm. Ooh, squirrel and takes off yeah <laughs> it's like would you get back over now he does come back but it's the initial takeoff that you're like oh my gosh what yeah and and they, they do test you and and I, I I don't even know where to go with uh, with him on this. I, I know that if I let the the one cat that we have, that's an indoor outdoor cat, can't let that cat out in the morning before his morning bathroom. And that's another thing that pet parents really have to understand. Dogs actually have internal clocks to know when they need to go to the bathroom. If we mm-hmm. miss them, well, what are you going to do? They're they're gonna they're gonna have an accident. Right. And is there right. Anything that you tell people, and I know it's kind of a little bit of a lengthy um, description, but in any of these circumstances, is there anything that you would tell pet parents in, in any of these examples of things that they need to be a little bit more intuitive to, or is this just, I would like to say this is just normal, but I think it's a little bit different for, for people like us because this is our life. Is there right, any kind right. of, we, <laughs> we see this all the time and this is normal. Like, I, I get this. I, I would say the biggest thing I notice with house training is that for some reason, um, it, people need to see it more as a pattern that develops over time. So you can, um, you can change patterns, but it takes like three months for a dog to change a pattern totally. So if, if like, say we want, uh, the dog to go out at nine o'clock in the morning. What are the things you need to do ahead of time so that that ensures the dog has to go to the bathroom at that time? You could feed them maybe at eight. I mean, so you're, when I, so okay, so I, I'm a little uh, obsessive compulsive. So I'll have a, a, a log and it'll have the time uh, when the, when, if the dog had an accident or didn't, what the dog did and what the circumstances was. And, and you keep this log for like a week or two, and you're going to start seeing patterns of when the dog naturally has to go outside to the bathroom. Because mm-hmm. if you're taking the dog out every two hours, they're always going to squirt. You know, that's just kind of a natural thing. But when they actually pee or they actually eliminate, you're going to, it's going to be there, and that pattern is going to be very obvious. Plus, you'll start seeing, oh, my, my dog has to have a bowel movement an hour after they eat, or maybe it's 45 minutes. And those all become very obvious. 
so I really like, you know, that's one thing that I use. And then to help them understand that they shouldn't go in the house, I, I, I use a crate because to me, I'm dealing with a muscle that has to be trained. And if mm-hmm. to help that be trained, I have to put the dog in an environment where they're going to be successful. So I can't let the dog run around the house because they may have an accident. So, so I normally say like I'm taking the dog out every two hours. At that two hour mark, I would put them in a, in a crate for 15 minutes and then take them out. So now I've made, they may have an urgency to go, but they're learning to control that muscle so they don't go to the bathroom. And then it's, it's not so much, you know, I'm not making them stay there for an hour where it's really going to cause damage, but it's enough to start giving them that control of the muscle. And you keep building on that. So you can kind of set the pattern with a dog over time to go to the bathroom, but you can't go. I mean, a dog has to go to the bathroom. It's like, you know, 10 hours being away from home. That's just a long time for anyone not to use the restroom. Is it weird to say that? I'm a little bit, I guess I'm a little OCD as well when I think to it this way. And that is, I will, um, oh, one second, one second. Okay. Sorry. Um, we'll just pick up from there. <laughs> Okay. I, I, I I sit outside of my daughter's school and I'm waiting for her and not usually it's almost kind of a rarity that uh, I ever have somebody come up to me because I have a phone up to my ear I have all this stuff going on and now some way somehow I'm gonna have to try to figure out how to do this so one second um I'm gonna okay. just sorry about that. Just in case, if if your car does start, just pull forward. I'll I'll just kind of sit right here in case. Yeah. I yeah I can't hear that. Almost kind of had a. St- I'm not a mechanic by any means, but almost. Could the starter could be alternator. Yeah. Yeah, just hit the four ways, and that way they'll know that I'm here for that reason. And I'm over right. That's where I go. Sorry. All right. I am sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Things, things that, you know, I always say this. When I record this podcast, the strangest things have always happened. I mean, there's 200 and some episodes, and there is a unique story almost in every one of them. So, yeah, I I, I would tell, I, I really should just do an episode on crazy things that have happened while recording the podcast. Yeah, that would probably be funny to listen to. I still think the funniest thing was one interview, and I, I never will tell the person the name who was really good guy, really good company, and it was still in their early days of having their company and they would do all of their um, business in their bathroom and so the interview was done while he was in the bathroom and nobody knew but about us and I found that to be one of the funniest of all of the uh, of all the episodes that might have been one of the more funny comical what the what so yeah <laughs> I mean it it everything that you can imagine it, it's it, it happens so, anyways, um, I will pick up from there. And what's funny is that I'll have to, as long as my phone one recorded, I'll have to chop that down, which is always fun. Um, I even had one person where we lost connection, and and that ended up, um, you know, causing issues. There's always a very bizarre um, situation with this. I. <laughs> I find it weird, and and I can't do it at the shop because you know what it's like with loud, you know, loud barking oh, and everything. Gosh, yeah. And I I do it when when this is the quietest time of my day, 
and yet, not today. Sorry. <laughs> and it's going to get, I'm just going to kind of let this kind of go for a second because as if you haven't heard, I'll even roll down the window. That's the outside of the school right now as they're letting the kids out. So I'm going to. Oh, geez. Yeah. She's, she's, <laughs> so usually when we're going, this is typically the time when we're, we're recording and stuff like that. You can't tell that it's going on. Mm-hmm. But some people are like, the little deal, there's like that 1% that get thrown off and keep going it's okay so i'll just kind of uh wait to hit record again until after i pass all this up and again my daughter she she sees the phone up so she knows oh he's recording doesn't does, it doesn't affect her at all she's like whatever um I think it's great. kind of funny that that she's like that mm-hmm. and she'll get in and then it'll be loud for a second too <laughs> I'll put that there for you. All right. And now it'll get quiet again. And uh, and that's usually the best part. So uh, we'll pick up. Um, I'm sorry to say, were we, were, we were somewhere, and I, and I kind of lost where we were. I'm sorry. Um, we're talking about house training yeah. and um, being OCD. That's right, the OCD. I remember exactly where I was going with that because I, I had this – Bizarre kind of, uh, I have this, you know, you say you write it down. I actually mentally put it into my brain, so I thought that was really interesting. So let me hit record, and we'll get started back. I have a very strange kind of OCD myself, but it's a little bit different. I actually, for some reason, and I can't remember names, to save my life, but I can tell exactly the time that my dogs have to go to the bathroom, which is weird. And if we're going on a hike, I know exactly how far it is from the house to the spot they like to go to the bathroom. I think that's, that's a, cool. Is it, or is it just weird? Because I kind of go with weird. I'm like, even my daughter, even my daughter, she's like, uh, this is the time that uh, usually Katana likes to poop. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, then that's why we have bags with us. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Well, it's, you're, you're. I think maybe it's you're also being very observant. You know, maybe they act a little different when it happens, or you know, you never know. I mean, there's. I remember there was a a horse, and people were trying to figure out how the horse could count, and it turned out that the man was making, um, he was moving his eyelash or something very subtle, and the horse picked up on that, and that's why he would move his his uh, hoof and you know to indicate how many so the horse really wasn't counting it was the man teaching the horse how many times to to paw the earth i thought that was pretty fascinating and I, i've seen dogs too you know I'll, I'll i'll fiddle around with mine and and sometimes um just whisper something and they they hear me and they do it and it's like why don't you do this all the time <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's kind of cool cuz there's they pick up on, I mean, I know dogs pick up on, you know, so many different cues that, we're, you know, we move our hands, we do something. Um, the best is um, after after breakfast, my husband and I will, will just kind of slightly touch the table and, and move the chair away. That's an indication for them to run in the other room and it's playtime. Oh. It, it You know, it's just so subtle. And I, I I was watching and trying to figure out what's causing them to respond. And that was it. You just, you, we touch the table and just slightly move back. And it's like both of them run real fast in the other room. Playtime. Interesting. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, it's funny how they can tell time. That's another thing that people don't realize. They can tell time. They know when it's yeah. when it's food. Our dogs, they know exactly when it's 9.30 or, well, actually, they get fed about 8.45 to 9.30, in, in between any of that. And they know. And if you're anything late, they just look at you and they're licking their lips and, where's my food? Where's my food? Where's my food? Yeah. Ah. Now, there was a study about that they they can smell the air and that tells them what time it is, or, you know, depending on whether the dew is close to the ground and different things. I'm I'm not sure what it is, but I, that was one study that said that they felt that that was how dogs could tell time. But how do they know when you're coming home? You know, that always amazes me is that you'd be, you know, you could be watching TV and all of a sudden the dog's like, 
you know, Phil's coming home, and they go to the door, and it's like, how did you know? <laughs> I, you know, I think they actually, and I, and this is this is really just guesstimation from from my perspective because our dogs are are exactly like this. They do that, and I think it's they. And this is going to sound ridiculous, but they recognize the sound of the engine. It's the only thing that I can might consider. Be. Yeah. And it, you know, and that's real possible because I've had dogs, um, their own, you know, like when I'm, when they're reactive, like for a prey drive, they want to go after cars and stuff. It's like only Suburbans with certain kind of tires or UPS trucks or something like that. And that was the only thing I could figure out is that they, it was the whine of the tires that caused them to go after it because other cars they wouldn't react to. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, they're so, unique in so many different ways that mm-hmm. uh, you know they, they'll know i mean even even down to and i i always put cats into the same kind of uh category here they even know when when you're gonna for example i let the dogs out and like i said i i off leash train them maybe because i'm lazy and i don't want to put a leash on them and walk them around that might be the case especially during winter and you know what that's like <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, I'll be standing there at the door, and one of my cats wants to, he'll come up to me and he'll meow, and he doesn't meow much, but he's just telling me, put me on my shoulder. I have to put him on my shoulder so he can look out and watch the dogs do whatever they do. Mm-hmm. Now, yeah, they it's just, like their job or something. Yeah, it's it really is. It's like they have to do this. They have to be part of this, and I need to make sure I watch them, that they're okay. I for what reason, I don't know. Same thing when you come home, it's the barking. And in, in, it's not a, I'm going to attack or intruder, intruder. It's, ooh, they're home, they're home, they're home. It's Right, they're very excited. Yeah. And, you know, I always, I always kind of reference back to the movie, um, was it Secret World of Pets or something like that, the animated movie. Mm-hmm. And I always think, you know, I wonder if my dogs are like that. And I think, no, oh, no, they're too lazy. Way too lazy. <laughs> I, you know they're they're so it, well. Think of what dogs can do. I mean that that was part of the like I, I'll do a little bit of uh, support work. So you know part of my job is to see what how I can get a dog to help a person do a task, and it it is amazing. And being a trainer, I, you do crazy things. So one of the things I, I taught my dog to do was open up the dryer take the clothes out of the dryer, put them in a basket, and then I put a strap on the basket and he would take the basket all the way upstairs. And, you know, so it's a series of events that you can teach him, but it amazed me. For one, I think he thought it was funny, but it amazed me how quickly he learned and that he wanted to do that. And then it was almost like any time I opened up the dryer on my own, he'd look at me like, well, that's my job. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I, you know, but when you're training them, they, they really do get into it. I mean, they, they love searching for things. They, you know, you, the dog, there's, I guess every dog has their own personality, so you can't force something on a dog. But when you find that connection and I'm not kidding, dogs will do pretty much anything and they just, they're just capable of so much. They really are. And that's, that's kind of the, Almost, I feel a little bit bad because you think to yourself, and, and I know you've had this happen. Maybe it hasn't popped out in your mind, but I, I, of course, think it and say it. When you think about a lot of dogs that are out there right now who are doing more than so many people, and they're they're <laughs> they're limited because they don't have the same abilities we have. I mean, for one, we have thumbs, and yet these dogs are are out there doing remarkable things and and have a and. I do think that all dogs need some kind of job or task. Mm-hmm. And yet, yeah, you think to yourself, gosh, you know, people could really learn from just dogs. And the fact that they, they don't, you don't need to give them much besides love, food, and, and some affection. Uh, obviously, love and affection are two different things in the way I look at it. Love is, mm-hmm. is yeah. So, caring and, yeah. Yeah. And, and the affection is, is, unfortunately, mine is, they they jump on the couch and they're pressed up against me and and I there's nothing wrong with that you know it, it I think I, you know, that's one thing people always there's a lot of generalizations out there with dog training and you have to take the situation if your dog was 
biting at your feet whenever you would move when you're on the couch, no, your dog should not be on the couch because that's a privilege. But if your dog's just being lovey and nothing else is, you know, your dog's a good dog and, you know, it doesn't have a lot of behavior issues, why not? I mean, that's a privilege and, and you know, it's just like sleeping. People have these big controversies. Should your dog sleep in bed with you or not? Well, you know, a lot has to do with your sleep pattern and their sleep pattern and then behavior. I mean, if if you're sleeping like a, a log and just kind of can't move at all because the minute you move, your dog's going to, you know, growl at you or snap at you, that's not a real healthy environment for you to have your dog in bed with you. So, you know, that that's the part of training that, I wish it was clear to people because I, a lot of times people do things that maybe they were taught as a child and then they apply it as an adult when really they're the adult and they should be working with the dog to change behaviors, not allowing things to happen. Totally agree. That's well, that that goes with feeding as well. I mean, how many times do – and we were talking about it before we even started recording. We were talking about feeding and, and different uh, – poorly <laughs> produced uh, pet food and it really does come down to well my dad or my mom fed it to our dog and their dad or their mom fed it to their dog so it's just a tradition mm-hmm. that's not, not, not I, really smart <laughs> well you know I, I think sometimes it's it's hard to be a responsible person it takes a little more effort but once you do it then you have a lot of um, repercussions. I mean, people are, you know, dogs respond better when they're fed well or, uh, you know, if they're trained to a point where you're not, you know, the worst thing is if you're frustrated with a dog and you're just trying to put your finger in the dike and try to stop these behaviors and close curtains or do whatever you do, rather than take a couple months and dedicate it to training the dog so that the rest of their life they, they don't make you frustrated. And, you know, that's that's a hard one. I've, I've gone to people's homes where their couch is all chewed up because the dog has, you know, just destroyed it and done all kinds of things. And then we talk about training and, and they're going, wow, that's really expensive. And I, I, I kind of, you know, I don't want to be rude, but I, I try to be politely point out the fact that your couch is very expensive, too. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's like make the effort to change it. They, a lot of people, I think, want to take a remote control and just say, and then the dog is better. But it, it takes effort, and it takes – it's an ongoing thing. You know, you can't, you can't expect something out of a dog if you don't practice it, mm-hmm. I guess. And, you know, my guess is with you, you're, you're very um, – I, I would consider you being disciplined if you got your dogs off leash because – Dogs don't naturally just walk off leash. They, it's, a, it's a pattern that's repeated many times, and there's boundaries set. So I think you just are, are good at it. You know, I, I, I'll, I'll really explain the in a simple way. It's, it's not really discipline. It's more or less trusting them and, and giving them the vote of confidence that I trust you enough to be able to do what you have to do and not have to be hovered over. I guess it's right. like kind of like what, how I raised my daughter. It's like, look, you know, I'm here and, and I'm here to do whatever you need me to do. But I'm not going to baby you. I'm not going to cut your meat at nine years old. I'm not going to, you know, put you in a ba- in a little baby tub and, and wash you. It's, it's kind of that mentality and, and giving a dog that sense of trust opposed to, and, and, you know, I do know a lot of people do their commands a little bit different. Mine is the house, and they know, come in. Mm-hmm. And it, it really wasn't a, a harsh kind of training. It was a very, you know, for the most part, we would be on leash at the beginning, and then I would take the leash off closer to the house, closer to the house, and use the word house. And that was really the, the simple side of it. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I... <laughs> Sometimes I, again, I always make this joke. Teachers always said does not play well with others, but I play great with pets. Dogs mm-hmm. and cats, I do a great job with. I can, I can communicate with them and I'm happy. It's the humans I have some kind of difficulty with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It tends to be a little harder, I know. Yeah, you know, we speak the same language yet I just don't understand you. You know, it's one of those moments. <laughs> well, I think, um, there's, there's a lot more motivating people than dogs. You know, dogs are pretty upfront with their feelings and they're, 
they're very willing to forgive. Um, I think people hold grudges and, and mm-hmm. have a lot of backstory when they, when you're working with them. And so, you know, it's a little different. Yeah, it's a bad gift. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, definitely. But it, what you're telling me, and, and this is, this is dog training in a nutshell. You have a problem. You're at a certain place with a problem. You want to be in another place with a problem and you work backwards and divide it up into tiny steps. And that's how you, you're always making your dog successful as you take the steps forward. Um, one of the things they always say is if your dog has failed at learning something, you've taken too big a step. Break it, break it down and the dog, and make the dog successful. So, you know, you're always, you're, you're telling them from a certain point what house is. And you're not giving them much leeway at the beginning to fail in that, but then you trust them and you're, you're, you're clear in your commands and what you demand out of them. And so you can move further and further back because they know what house is. And then, you know, it doesn't matter what the distance is because you've divided it up enough to make them successful at, at achieving it. And the same is with, with walking, you know, getting them off leash. If you're constantly controlling your dog on leash, what do you think they get used to? Mm-hmm. They feel, you know, it's that pull. So why not take a little extra time and teach them that they shouldn't pull and then they start learning to walk next to you without the, you know, the control of a leash and then you can just take the leash off and, and they'll be, they'll listen to you because you're communicating verbally and with your body. Now on, on our hikes, when we go on our little bike path, I have a leash on both of my dogs, but, but that's just, you know, law, <laughs> but, but yeah, you know, the same thing goes with like Sumo, who's our, our new, um, Akita, he'll pull a little bit and it's okay. Stop and sit. Yeah. And, and if he doesn't, and we'll go again. If he does it again, stop, sit. Mm-hmm. And it's, it it's a question. Too. Yes. Yeah. But that's all that this really comes down to is it's patience. And and a lot of people don't understand that, you know, I'm just too busy in my time. I don't have time for patience. Well, we got to find them. I mean, that's oh, the yeah. hard part. Well, it's just like road rage and all the other things. You know, you just, you got to kind of ease off of some of this stuff and say, you know, does it really matter? And and then tone yourself down because I think we could be angry all the time if we really wanted to. Yeah, it's, it seems so pointless at times. There's things to be angry about, of course, but, you know. Now, something I see a lot, and, and I'm sure you do too, but maybe maybe not, I don't know. I will have a customer come in with their dog, and, and they will say, oh, well, he has anxiety issues. But it's really not the dog that has the anxiety issue. It's actually the pet parent. Yeah. Do you deal with yeah. that a lot? <laughs> you do. That's that's one of my uh, my little talks because um, that's the point where I try to point out that you're causing the behavior, not the dog. And you know, it's it's hard. It's some you know, but if you <laughs> if you train them just like the dog, I mean, you 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 slowly work with it, the owners and try to change. I always say it's going to be a lifestyle change with you, and give them some things to work on. So when the next time you come. The dog is more relaxed, but it's actually because the owner's more confident and, and less hovering on the dog. And yeah, it's it's fascinating. You know, I think people in their heart are trying. You know, they want to do the best for the dog, but they have different ways that they were raised, and a lot of that comes into play with when you're taking care of a dog. And well, you you see it all. You know, when you when you train enough dogs and people. True. I mean, it's it's funny because it's like you don't want to tell them, no, your dog really doesn't have this anxiety. <laughs> the anxiety is going from your body into your hand, down through the leash, into the dog. It's yeah. really cool. But, you know, and that's that's a, something that I always try to explain to people, and it's always so nice to talk to somebody who actually speaks this language, too. But, oh. Well, yeah, I mean, having children, too, I think helps a lot because you can see – when kids have a high energy, if mm-hmm. you get caught up in it and are high energy with it, you know, you're in trouble. But if you start slowing down and talking slower, all of a sudden, you know, they kind of brings that energy level down. And, and it's, dogs are much more receptive than children on that, but it's, it's amazing to see. It really is. 
Now, then, there's another hot topic that I wanted to talk to you about because it's so important. And I think a lot of pet parents make this mistake of thinking, oh, it's cute. It's not a big deal. Yet, maybe maybe it's just me, but I think this is a really big deal. And that's dogs that are mouthing. Mouthing oh. to me. Yep. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not alone here. It's like, no, oh, it's not. cute. It's cute. No, it's not cute. It's a bad thing. And I never know how to tell people exactly in the right words it's wrong. How do you tell people, you know, and how do you correct them? Well, um, ex- unfortunately, I had some experience where um, a client, I ended up in, in court with the client because the dog was in the front yard. A little girl came by, went to pet the dog, and the dog was mouthy and wasn't biting the girl, but had put its mouth on her and the girl pulled her hand away and and got a cut on her hand and it got really out of hand. And so there was all this stuff. So just knowing that, that there can be mistakes made and then you have these problems with your neighbor thinking that the dog needs to be put down and all this kind of stuff. um, I just say the dog doesn't need to mouth you. Uh, this is a carryover from when they were puppies. It's called, uh, pl- they call it play biting. Um, it's just the way dogs interact, but it's not a human dog interaction, and, and it really should be stopped. And I know a lot of people say, oh, they don't bite hard or this or that. It's like, that's not the situation. It's what happens if, and, you know, you ha- and I try to always explain about the little girl and what happened there, but um, the best way to stop it is, um, you know, the you, you set boundaries. So you play with a dog and they get excited and they start play biting with you. Stop the play. And, you know, of course you say no and stop. And then you just go right back to playing. And every time the dog puts their hand, you know, their mouth on your hand, you, you just stop. It's, it's explaining to the dog that we can still play, but it's more on my terms and you don't need to do this. And most dogs pick up on that. Puppies, you sometimes have to do this thing called the play bite hold where you're you're actually kind of holding their mouth. Um, you put them, there's a position, you kind of put them between your legs so they can't get away, and you just hold them very gently so that they can get their tongue in and out, and you just no, no, and you're just telling them that that's inappropriate because the way I look at it is when you take on a puppy, you've become the surrogate mother, and that puppy is still learning even though it's in, you know, living with you. And so you need to teach behaviors that are appropriate to the puppy so that it can exist in our human world. And that's one of them is the play biting. I just, it, it, oh, it's terrible. I mean, it, so it, many dogs, when they get excited like that, and oh, my God, yeah. <laughs> and you know what? I'm going to kind of transition just ever so slightly and segue into something else that really does come into the same conversation that's plain rough. You know how oh, yeah. that old mentality that you're only exerting all of the energy? Not the case. Mm-hmm. You don't want to play rough because then what happens? But bad things happen. And I'm sure you have a great <laughs> way of putting this much better than me. Well, it, it escalates. Um, when, when a dog is in a high energy state, two things can happen. They can either play or they can get very aggressive. And Depending on the situation, you, you never really know when they're going to, you know, when that switch is going to click on them. Um, we're here again. We're we're teaching them what what's right and wrong. I call it dog etiquette because I really feel that we want a dog to be well behaved in our environment, and they're more than willing. They're domesticated. They're more willing to do that and accept those things because. They're very easygoing animals. They, they like to adjust and, and please us, and, and so they, they'll do what we want pretty much. So if you're roughhousing with a dog, and when you play tug with a dog, there's there's so many things involved in there. Dogs, it's, it's really not a real natural thing for dogs to play tug. They usually play with each other and, and kind of butt each other and, you know, gnaw on each other and stuff. So when you're playing tug, you're autom- automatically doing kind of a, a dominant behavior. I have something, and I'm pulling it away from you, but yet I want you to be very dominant and pull it away from me. And so it's not probably one of the best things to do with a dog. I'd rather do things like, you know, mind games, you know, find 
find this treat or find a toy or, or, you know, just tricks or whatever so that the dog's mentally stimulated rather than trying to develop their prey drive and, and that type of thing. Um, when you teach dogs for protection training, guess what you're doing? You're playing tug, you're doing roughhousing, you're doing a lot of the things because you want this dog to be respond very assertively towards whatever you you cause to be a threat. So you're teaching the dog this. You don't want that dog to be doing it on their own because if a, a dog that doesn't have an out can become a very, very aggressive dog and unpredictable. So it's not a good idea. Couldn't, you see, I couldn't say it that well. That's why I'm like, you know what, I'm going to pass that one right over to you. because. <laughs> yeah. You, you know, it, it comes from all the things that you do with, like, I, I see so many people tell me, oh, I want my dog to be, a, you know, a protection dog. That's why it's barking out the door and barking all these things. And I'm going, you know what, what stops your dog from determining what is a threat and what isn't a threat? You're You're nowhere involved in that. Your dog is making all those decisions mm-hmm. for you. And that's that's not a good environment because dogs, you know, they don't make very good decisions at times, and and we need to be there to kind of help them through some of those things. So, I, I always try to say, if you have a good relationship with your dog and you're afraid, that dog is going to be the best protection dog that you ever wanted. Mm-hmm. I I I don't worry about if somebody was to break into my house. I I don't need anything besides my two Akitas alone. <laughs> That's that's gonna do it, especially since one's eighty some pounds. Oh my god! Just looking at it will probably be enough for a person. And you you know exactly when an Akita barks, it's a different type of bark. I mean, it's oh it's, god, yes, this is wolf, and it's it's so mild. And yet, then when they do the full bark, you're like, "Woo! I'm afraid of you," and yet you're protecting me. But even at that, you know, you can have dogs that are Akitas, pit bulls, Doberman pinchers, whatever Rottweilers. You don't have to actually breed them to be a protection. They're going to protect you. Their their whole right. responsibility in life and purpose in their mind. I I am here to protect master and my domain. Right. Yeah. Your job is to tone them down so and set boundaries so that they don't make mistakes. And, right. And see something as a threat. So yeah, that's that's they call them high caliber dogs because that's. That's in them. They they have this 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 that's part of their instincts is is that protection and to be very alert to strange you know scratches on the window or you know, noises or whatever movements and things. I always think it's kind of funny because I'm like, there you don't need to protect you don't need to you know make this dog. It's like I I've heard this this case made and I'm just right away my hand just goes right over my face and that I would never feed raw. Now my dogs are fed raw. My cats are fed raw. And I would never do that because I wouldn't want them to have the taste of blood. I'm like, you're kidding. <laughs> you really are kidding. <laughs> and that's, see, that's part of the, you know, the assumptions. And then it becomes, they feel it's truth, but it's actually, what is it based on? I mean, that's false facts. And it just, that's for education. It's, it's almost an ongoing thing for any kind of canine professional. You're, you have to educate people because there's all these myths going around that you just, when you're in the business, you just shake your head going, oh my God, just like a greyhound can't sit. Like, well, there's reasons why they have difficulty, but it's, they can sit. I mean, it's just their muscles that are kind of stopping them from doing a nice sit. But, you know, or or you should never have a husky off the leash because they will run away. Well, any dog that isn't trained. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I mean, it's based on some some truth, but, oh, my gosh, I, it's, it's amazing. With, I'm sure you hear it a lot with grooming, too, because, you know, pe- there's things that people think are right, and it's, it's crazy. Well, a lot of it, and, and I'm sure you go through this, is you hear it. And, and we, you know, and I'll, I'll make this one as simple as possible for when people come to us with these questions. We simply say we know of a couple great trainers. We actually have one that we take our own dog to just because we want to make sure we get that good Samaritan type uh, performance out of Sumo. And I'm not going to, like I said, at the very beginning of all this, I I had 0% training and I, I'd say I'm at 2% right now. So I'm not anywhere near what you guys are. You guys are trained. So 
we always say, look, here's what we would suggest, and it's always go to a qualified trainer. And this is exactly where you want to be. This is exactly what you want to do because you're going to go in circles sometimes, and then you're going to use a bunch of words, and dogs are not going to respond to a mm-hmm. full vocabulary. They want quick, simple, one-word responses. Sit, stay, come, house, whatever. And they don't need you to go their name and da 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 They just mm-hmm. want it. It's quick. Let's just, let's just get it over with, all right? People think that, no, 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 we have to have a full conversation. It's like, no, no. Yeah. But yeah, this it, also, it, these rumors do come out, and, and I'm, I'm not saying all. I'm saying a very small percentage, but a lot of this comes from veterinarians, too. They yeah. perpetuate this cycle, too. Well, they're, they're not, from what I understand, they get one course, I believe, in um, behavioral training or something like that. So it, I feel that... We all have our our own specialty, and I don't give vet advice. I don't give rooming advice. I do training, but I always refer because, to me, that way I know the person's getting the best of every world that they need to. I'm not a nutritionist. I have some ideas, but here, talk to someone that's knowledgeable on it. You know, so I think that helps a little bit because I know we get a lot of people that, the vet told us to slap the dog on the nose, and it's like, well, you know, that's one way. <laughs> and see, you're always trying to help, but you know, it's 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 unfortunate, but there's there's a lot of misinformation out there and I don't think the internet helps very much at times. So it's it's good when there's people that, you know, are have integrity and are willing to share good information and, and get it out there. That's really that sums up every bit of it. And you're right. I mean there is a great deal of information and some good, some bad and a lot of the information you do see, and I, I know you see it out there too, is a lot of the old stuff that has been proven to not work, but it's still out there and still circulating. You're like, how is this still out there? We we know it's not going to work. I mean, roll up a newspaper and pop them on the nose. I'm like, how is that going to teach anybody anything? Yeah, and and that's what you're dealing with when you have a person that is had a child. I mean, had a, had a dog when they were a kid. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of the training method and all these things. And then now they have a dog as an adult, and they're still doing some of those things, and they're having problems. True. And, and so it's you know it's it's a slow process educating people, but it's I think it's necessary. Oh, it's very necessary. Now, what's great about what you're doing with Acme Canine is that you're not just saying, "Well, it's just me." You actually have people who actually work with you as well, which is cool. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, you, I'm going to say this and I'll, I'll go right out there and put my name on this part. And that is, you're not saying it's all about me or a training. And I know, I know, you know exactly where I'm going here. A lot of people are just saying, I know it all. And I'm, I'm not, I'm not speaking of anybody in particular, but there's a lot of people who will, will do that. And you're like, I have a, an actual group. So it's not about just me. And that I love that. And and anything you wanted to throw in on that, I would love to hear. Oh. Well, my mom is looking for experts to help write on the on the blog because I think it, it just to me, if I if I can form a canine resource for people to go to, I, I would love it because um the more information in a centrally located area where you can ask questions and communicate I mean, that's got to help. I've had people even contact me, and they, they're they seeing a dog trainer, and they're not quite sure, and they'll ask, like, my advice or someone else's advice on it. And, you know, we can at least give them – and it's almost like getting a second opinion, but we can reassure them about certain things and maybe say, well, why don't you ask this question to help answer? Because, you know, people are putting their, their, their trust of their animal – and, you know, this is the way it's got to be to train these dogs. And, and sometimes maybe the match isn't quite right. And it's good to have that second opinion just to make sure that you you do have the right trainer for your dog. And that's that's a huge thing right there is the right trainer for your dog. I mean, mm-hmm. not it's not everybody is not, not suit for, suited for that one dog or even for that pet parent. 
And right. that's, and I, we say that about grooming. Not every, you can go to a big box store. It doesn't mean that you're going to get this perfect cut. Doesn't mean if you're going to go to a ball and pop, you're going to get the perfect cut. It, it really is how your dog is going to respond to the person. Same thing goes mm-hmm. with veterinarians. Oh, and yeah. You got to find the right person because sometimes they may be qualified. It just may not be a right fit. And then you're just pushing exactly. and pushing at it. Drives me nuts. Right. Well, no, I mean, you're, we're dealing with living things. So, yeah. I mean, how can how can you expect something different? I think that's – I had some uh, child psychiatrists. Um, they were having problems with their dog. And it just cracked me up when I was working with them because I'd do something and explain it, and they'd, they'd rattle off some – you know, medical reason that that happens in children. Oh, yeah, that's blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and we went through this whole session, and after the hour, you know, I'm going, okay, so you know all the things to do. And they said, you know what? We ha- we never made that relationship that we can treat a dog in the same way as we would help with children with some of their behavioral issues. And it, it just kind of stuck in my head like, you know, I, that's my job is to kind of point things out that – are obvious to me and seem common sense, but they really aren't to the person that owns the dog or, or hasn't had that much dog experience. Totally true. Totally true. Now let's go into, cause you had mentioned blog, Spike's dog blog. How did you get started with Spike's dog blog? Oh, um, I had a crazy dog named Spike. <laughs> he's, and so he, he kind of started the blog because, um, he was a, a French bulldog Shih Tzu mix. He looked kind of like a, a brindle Yoda and just a real personality. And we would always joke around and, and have like Spike saying things, you know, he always put us like a cigar in his mouth and say, oh, Spike would say this. So it, we started saying, you know, we should write something like that. So we started um, writing a blog kind of from the dog's point of view. And so a lot of the, they actually are that way. And I've kind of continued it with my, my two other dogs, Autumn and Penny, that they write up from the dog's point of view, because you can cover a lot of things that might be a little bit sensitive when it comes from the dog rather than it comes from a person. So <laughs> we've done that a couple of times. And then um, we just, you know, it's one of those things about getting things out. So every client that uh, ever worked with me or showed some interest, you know, in, in, in what we did, they would always be on the, you know, we'd, we'd hook them up with the blog so that, it was a supplement to what their learning experience was. You know, my, I, I'm a real believer in explaining why, because to me, it answers, it, it solves a lot of the problems in the future. So, you know, when we're, we'll always give them handouts and different things. And several clients said, you know, this is great information. You should make it more accessible to people. And so that's kind of how it got started. And we've been doing it, well, probably since 2004, I think. Well, there's well. a lot of information on there. I've, I've I said this to everybody who has a blog. I just I never know where to start. I, I that beginning, middle, and end. I just never can get there. And I commend you for it. <laughs> Thanks. Well, you know, it, it, how I do it is is um, you know when you listen to podcasts. Well, I, I read things and go, oh my gosh, I gotta write about that. So that's where I get a lot of my subject matter is, is you know, this passion because it's like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe this person said this. And so then I'll, I'll write about something to try to help educate people on, on a different, <laughs> this is not what you should be doing. With, this is probably a better way to go about it. So that, that's a lot of it. And then um, just, you know, my knowledge over time, how to deal with separation anxiety and, and the things I've learned with aggression and um Clients are, you know, they, they're my best source of information. They'll, they'll, they'll ask me a question and I'll go, oh my God, that makes the perfect article. So then I start writing about that too. Kennel aggression. That's my favorite. Still my favorite. Kennel aggression can just be a pain in the bahuki. Oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> and of course, having a pet salon, what do you think we have? Oh. <laughs> that's fun to work with. I'll tell you. Oh that's, my gosh, yeah. Yeah. It, you can't really train through it. All you can do is try to bridge some kind of communication between the dog and you and hope it works. Yeah. Um, sometimes, you know, I, I, I use commands to refocus the dogs to help them, you know, overcome some of their 
their instincts and fears. Um, a lot of times having your dog do a command in the kennel is, is a good way to start breaking that pattern. So you might want to try that. I, you know, it's, it's always so funny. You, you, we tell the pet parents about this and again, it's, it's really what happens when the kid goes home and if there's ever going to be any kind of work. And sometimes, you know, sometimes it could just be a previous groomer or play, previous place was really scary and, and there's that residual kind of fear. And then you can work past it. But boy, that, that's a, that one's a trick. <laughs> Oh my gosh, yeah, because you, you, everything is head on too, which is pretty much, I mean, that's a threatening signal already because you're facing the dog head on, you're doing a lot of things like that, so I could see how that could even be brought out. I never even thought about that one. Yeah, that's yep. a crazy one. I, you know, the, the simple way, and, and I'll even give this one out, and the simple way is that we have one of those slip leads, and we mm-hmm. lasso it, so it goes around, you know, where their neck would be, and then that will control them towards you and then you're able without getting bit to kind of reach around and again this is all an art form so please folks don't try it at home um it takes it takes a little bit of of some kind of approach and you you can talk to them sometimes if you just you don't even have to you know right away reach and go for them you can you talk to them uh, but by positioning them and and having a little bit of control that's the that's exactly where it really comes down to where I guess the obedience comes into it is the control. Once a dog knows who's in control, yep, they respect you. <laughs> they do, and you know, yeah. I I always kind of laugh because I'm like, you don't have to be aggressive, you don't have to be forceful. No. You, you you really just they have to know. Okay, you're you're going to be in control of it, and it does work. And uh, there you. Know, Look, if if dogs are not kennel trained, that's a whole new experience in its own self. So that could be a challenge, especially if they've never yeah. seen a kennel before. Wow! Yeah, that's a that's a real interesting one. I would never have thought of that. We'll we'll do things like, um, you know, uh, yawn or mm-hmm. scratch our legs. You know, any kind of calming signal. You know, you know, of course, you're not making direct contact with the eyes and stuff, but yeah, that's that's a t- that's a real tough one. See I if I ever think about that for grooming. <laughs> if I ever think if I ever see excessive yawning, that would be a sign of, and this is just what I would I would see it as a sign of stress, overstressed. Yeah, but it's it's a it's a, it's a, it's a stress reliever, so it's called the calming signal. Hmm. So if you do it, you're letting the dog know that you're not a threat. Oh, I, I, I thought you were talking about the dog itself doing it. Oh, yeah. Well, no, if the dog's doing it, then, yeah, you know that they're trying to tell you, ah, I can't handle this situation. Yeah. But, yes, if you do that and if you if you kind of scratch your leg, those are, are uh, easy signals to give to a dog that, you know, that it, you're not trying to, you know, dominate them or anything like that. So it could tone them down a little bit. You know, it's, it's funny, and I, I'm sure you've covered this part, and that is, and I, I, I'm going to I'm going to say this in, in a weird way, but I've never really dealt with this. But men in this profession, it's very uncommon because usually there are a lot of aggressions that male aggression with dogs. I don't mm-hmm. see that, and I, and I'm not a small guy. I'm a very tall guy, so you would think that I'd have two strikes against me right out the gate. But if I have a dog that's that's upset or or scared. I'll usually just sit down on the floor, have the lead, and I'll just talk to them, and it works. Yeah, but, yeah. right. Because you're you're making yourself smaller. Mm-hmm. You're you're so you're not not as much of a threat. You're you're using your patience because you're not forcing the dog to do something. You're making it to them do it more on their time than mm-hmm. yours. So you're setting the dog up for success. I don't think a lot of people think about that. They, you know, it's like, oh, I got to get this dog done. They, you know, go in there, grab the dog, and pull him out, and there you go. Now you have a bad experience. Now, how do we change that bad experience? And they, they say it takes like uh, ten good experiences to counter one bad experience. So, just like nail trims and stuff. I mean, mm-hmm. it's 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 a hard process to to really get the dog not to feel. I mean, they had. A bad experience. They don't want it again. So you know, they and that's how they learn is off of experiences. So you really got to work on those things. You know what drives? Do you, do you, no, go ahead. 
Go ahead. So I was going to ask you, do you offer like um, where when they're puppies, they can come in and, and experience mm-hmm. your facility and get used to the smells and sounds and stuff? We do. We actually encourage um, come in, have a meet and greet first. Um, the way we designed our shop is an open concept mm-hmm. so that the kennels are in the same room with us. It's just one one spot. Everything's open so anybody can see everything. And that way the dogs don't, even cats, they're not isolated in another room. So they're not, they're not, you know, feeling like they're being right. kenneled. Um, and of course they can look, if they look, I mean, the kennels are, are just kennels. There are no, no barriers to any of them. So they can kind of see in a 360 angle. They can look to the left and they can see, you know, out the main glass, which is, you know, quite a few feet past our, our little bird area. Um, but we make sure and, and we definitely always, always recommend if you have a puppy, definitely come in for a meet and greet first so that it's not the veterinary clinic because, again, that's a big thing. Another thing that we always tell people is don't take, especially a puppy, don't take a puppy to the vet and then over to the actual groomer because oh they'll associate the same. <laughs> yeah. They're just little yeah. things. Um, right. That they're absorbing everything. So, yeah. Something that's else. That's very good. Here's something that will really probably spin your head. And I've I've heard of them, and I just cringe. And there's groomers out there that love to pride themselves that they can have your dog back in one hour. That's not a good thing. That is a terrible thing. Can you imagine going in, you're bathed, dried, and groomed all in an hour? That's a lot of stress. <laughs> and people don't realize, oh, that's a great thing because it's really quick. This is yeah, a life. Yeah. This isn't fast food. You shouldn't yeah. be just putting. Can you imagine doing that to a three-year-old child? I mean, trauma. So yes, and yeah. nail trimming. I don't like to use the actual standard nail trimmers. I use a grinder, less mm-hmm. abrasive, so they don't right. they don't have that clink. Can you imagine that clink on your fingers? Oh gosh, that would. If you think of the German Shepherd nails or a Husky oh. nails that are huge. Yeah, that would yeah. be awful. Yeah, I, you know, we've we started um, like with our puppy classes where you know, people tend to know to handle the feet now, and and so we'll we'll take them to the point of, you know, we want them to like splay the toes and and take each toe and maybe touch like a spoon next to it so they get used mm-hmm. to the metal touch. You know, so it's a natural process. It's not like one day you just start clipping because I think a lot of people when they're teaching them they they want to get it done. Mm-hmm. And it's like, well, this is a training experience this is a learning experience for the dog. It's not, you know, to get the nails trimmed. And so we've worked a lot with that with our clients, too, because, uh, well, I mean, just one thing that was kind of misunderstood. You know, you, you, there's a difference between the task and teaching. And mm-hmm. sometimes it takes a little longer. You know, one thing that I've I've noticed in this industry is that whether you're a veterinarian you're a trainer, you're a groomer, what are, you're part of a boarding facility is that we're all part of, in a, in a percentage of these dogs lives. And if all of us keep at a certain pace and follow each other's rules so that we can best treat them, Mm -hmm. we can completely wipe out all the, the garbage that's out there and all the negative. Uh, Yeah. Well, you know, I even got to the point, where we would call the vets up and say, okay, what's going on now? You know, what, what's the most common disease or what, what are dogs coming in for? Because being in a boarding facility, we, you know, the dogs are coming through and, and we can see people and maybe say, you know, if you notice this with your dog, this is what's going on at the vets. And so we may need to go to the vet. So, you know, communicating back and forth and helping people out. Um, we've had, like, I, we always had groomers come because, you know, part of the boarding thing is that you give them a bath. Mm-hmm. We were giving terrible baths to the dogs. It took, you know, the groomer to show us this is how you give a good bath so it's not so stressed and what the water temperature. And, mm-hmm. I mean, it was a wonderful learning experience. But I don't know if people interact that much. You know, it, it takes time. It's a it really science. Would be nice. It is a mm-hmm. science. And it's a science to all of this. I mean, from top to bottom, it's understanding What's in front of you? Don't look at it as a a, a dollar sign. 
that's another thing that we I think we all can say we see is that some people just treat it as a, a dollar, and True. it's a life. It's another life. I mean, how we're we're treating this as if it's just money, it's currency. I don't. It doesn't matter. We it could be cold water. What's it going to know? Are you crazy? I mean, seriously. There's, it has pain receptors. It has oh, nerves. I mean, how can you think that way? But they do. Well, they do. Right. <laughs> and I, 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 I think the thing is, you, your gestures and your true passion. Once you know, if if it comes out, and I, a lot of times I feel that people are the good people are going to come to you, and you don't have to worry about your business if if you're doing a good job and you really care about the dog, it shows. We and I, people appreciate it. We 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 kind of have people upset that we can't get them in soon enough. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's a bad problem, huh? <laughs> it's a bad problem, especially when they're like, "Well, can you just work a weekend here, just to kind of, you know?" Oh yeah, I like to, but I do need some other time to do other things. <laughs> well, you need downtime, like everybody. I don't know what that is. Actually, I take, <laughs> I, I do take Sundays as my down day. That's the only day I take in a week. So let's move on to, is it KSCO Pet Radio, the podcast that you have on your website? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hooked up with David. He's out in California, and um, we we do, uh, well, I, I do dog training by radio, um, and we now we're kind of talking more about different issues, and it's still dog training, but it's more behavioral things that we're working on, but it, it's really a good radio. I mean, you can listen to it on the computer. There's a internet way of doing it. I, I'm not that way kind of person that can explain it, but um, he'll bring on the most fascinating guests. Um, there's a, a person that her passion is making sure that uh, seat, you know, dogs, uh, seat harnesses don't break when when you have car accident mm-hmm. and and different things like that and so she actually um uh, she was on there and it, it's a big i mean it's it's not just like a little hobby anymore it's actually her side business and they test uh you know cars with these these dog harnesses and it's sad to, to know that most harnesses don't really work mm-hmm. and that's a bad sign but he's had um different rescues on and he's had people there's a um, oh, I don't know the initials, but it's the behavioral, uh, it's a group of, um, an organization for behavioral canine professionals. I don't know what, but they have a thing that's really cool. They're, they're doing, they're trying to get as many people as possible, but they have, um, a little test that you take and you, it, they're, they want you to tell what breeds are in this dog. And so you look at this picture and then they give you some examples of what it might be in the dog and you pick them and they're going to do a study on it because they're trying they, – they, too many people look at animals and say, oh, that's a pit bull or that's this. Mm-hmm. And so they're trying to actually figure out if people can actually identify certain breeds in dogs even though it may have been like, you know, five generations past or something like that. So that, that's, that was kind of an interesting one. But, yeah, he does a really nice job and uh been doing that for several months now. Um, that's yeah. on Sundays at well my I'm in from Ohio, so my time is uh I I get on around three or four, but it's noon to three California time. It's always so funny because when I started doing this, nobody thought about doing anything when it came to pets. And it's been four years and I've watched it grow and I'm actually quite happy. I'm like, Hey, you know what? This is good. At it least people are jumping in on it. Because it, there's so many topics. And so many people are not able to actually have a voice when they should. It, let's stop talking about garbage that has no significance. Let's talk about something that actually is going to benefit. And oh, that's yeah. and fluffed. More, yeah. And the more knowledge you gain, the better it is, the better understanding you have of your animals, and, and the better way you can, you can care for them better, I think, because mm-hmm. you do understand them better. Agreed. And that's, that's the whole purpose, I think. Now, some of your accolades, some of just a couple of your accolades, IACP, Women in Pet Industry, and one that I'm actually going to be joining, or at least attempting to join, is the Dog Riders Association of America. So mm-hmm. that's just to say it a little bit. I mean, I'm sure you have a great deal more. That is really impressive. Very impressive. Oh, thank you. 
well, uh, you can tell I'm passionate about it. I mean, it's um, it's it's been a way of life for so many years. It's just it. I, I know I'm a dog trainer because I can actually now walk up, up to a dog and they they already know that I'm a leader. And people will go, my dog never acts this way. Why is it <laughs> acting this way around you? And it's like it's so ingrained in me now that. You know, I don't think I could act any other way. Totally understand. And now, do you still write for the local magazine? Uh, the, the I write for Pet Boarding and Daycare Magazine. And actually, I, I'm going to be out there next weekend giving a workshop on body language. And also, something that you might appreciate is uh, physical exams on dogs. Mm-hmm. People should give this physical exam. It's called the snout to tail. You do it every mm-hmm. day. It's You know, your dog is going to be the best the easiest to handle because they've been touched and prodded all over the place and they're used to you doing it and it you find things you know if they're if they have an injury or a lump or a bump or maybe you notice something with their tooth you know you're able to find it very quickly and uh, you know we I started at the at the boarding facility and I I really think that I, that's one of the things that you know I, I really promote for daycares and and uh, boarding facilities to do that because they miss out on a, you miss out on a lot of things. You know the dog's mm-hmm. in your care, but unless you're right on that dog, you're going to miss the cuts and you're going to miss some of the maybe some of the diseases that they have, like you know canine cough or something like that. But you can catch it very quickly if you do these exams every day. And they're really simple. I mean, it, it's not like it's it, you don't have to have DVM at the end of your name to do it. It's really no, simple and. No. You know, for for all of us who actually get our hands on these dogs, it's it's really quite simple. And I don't understand why people don't say, "Hey, did you notice that your dog has a lump on its right back hip, or you know, it had a weird cut right here?" And then you always hear the the most interesting stories. I mean, I had one one time one person dropped off their dog, and I saw this dog many times, and it it had a really interesting bowel movement. And it was a different color than I've ever seen. And I mentioned it to them. And they go, yep, that would explain it. And, and I had this curiosity of, what do you mean? Mm-hmm. It had a, there was a donkey that had passed away on our property. And uh, it got over to it and, and ate a great deal of it. So I'm pretty sure that's what it was. Really? <laughs> you could have told me that before. Right. Yes. You're, yeah, the dog's in your care, so you're, you're like, oh, my gosh. Yeah, I had wow. never seen anything like that before, and they're like, yeah, it's probably that reason. And, and you know, transparency. I think that we're we're in a whole new age of it, and why we can't have this dialogue with people, it's, it's, it's needed. I mean, how many oh. times will you actually tell somebody, hey, this is wrong, and I didn't even notice it. Yeah. Somebody. That's. That's a big thing. Yeah, I do. I, we could we, we call it being dog centric. I mean, the <laughs> dog is your main purpose, and mm-hmm. everything revolves around it. That's how your business should should work. It shouldn't be the dog is only a part of your business. Mm-hmm. Different way of thinking. No, I totally I'm totally with you on that, and I, I completely see it the same way. Is there anything that we didn't cover that we should be covering? Gosh, I don't know. We had a good talk. <laughs> I typically try for it. I mean, there are things that, of course, I'm, I can miss things very easily. So that's why I'm like, oh, well, I want to make sure I, I put everything out there that, that we could talk about. I mean, you're doing a great job. And, you know, obviously go down to acmecanine.com. Um, check out Spike's dog blog. Um, questions, I'm sure that you have ways, you have emailed through there. There's definitely ways of, of checking you out and I'll, I'll put it all in the description page as well um oh, thank you oh no thank you and you know come back anytime tell us more stories and and kind of tell us how we can be better pet parents because honestly even i need the help as well and it's it's always beneficial to me to be able to learn from great people well i appreciate that and i have enjoyed talking with you and i think i'm going to write an article about kennel aggression <laughs> Kim aggression is an interesting one. All right. Well, I'm Chris Green. Have a petastic week. Bye-bye, everybody.
Okay, gotta go in my bedtime.